All right, you're going to take your Bible. You're going to turn to Revelation 7 this morning. Revelation 7. And uh, then what we'll do is we'll just do, basically, I can show you how I, how I study, how I get things together, how I put notes together and lessons together, messages together, things like that. Um, God's had me studying like this for a long time. And when he did, when it, when, when it finally sunk in, I want to tell you, it didn't, it, it became like Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I used to have a, a pretty serious problem, a lot of you remember, where I'd be getting in Sunday school and all of a sudden, man, my nerves would be so rattled I'd have to run to the restroom and everything else. And I was so worried about the... the message I was going to preach after Sunday school. I was so worried about that. And God just kind of took that away from me by helping me study better or study, I'd say, easier for me. Now, everybody's got their thing and I don't want to take you away from that. Somebody's asked me, Pastor Mike, have you read the whole Bible? And I would say, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Uh, because of the way that I have learned to study and prepare notes and things like that, um, I do exactly what Paul said. I preach the Word. And usually, God gives me a, a Word a phrase or an idea out of the Bible. And if it's an idea, then a lot of times you think, how would the Bible say something like that? Or how does the Bible say or teach things like that? And I use this software now because it was developed specifically for our church and for our ministry by Donna um, who is an outstanding software writer. She did all this for free, and I was willing to pay money for this. And I'm telling you, she has just helped me in ways I never thought possible. The other Bible search softwares out there that you can get, that you buy and stuff like that, they don't give you exact word searches. Like I have up here on the screen, I've typed in the phrase Word of God. Now, the one I use on my phone is from a company called Ticarta. I don't know what that is, but anyway, it's just a King James. They've got other versions that you can buy, but the King James is free. So anyway, uh, you type in the phrase Word of God, you're going to get every verse in the Bible with the word Word in it, the word of in it, the word God in it. And that's confusing. That's not what I want. I want to see where the phrase Word of God is in the Bible. And with me, I want to know how many times it's there. Okay? Which happens to be 49 times. That's 7 times 7, George. Imagine that. That that phrase is in your Bible exactly 49 times. You couldn't get any more perfect than 7 times 7. 49 times. I saw that, and that's what really got me going with Bible numbers. I went, that's amazing that that's in there. And I could just, I could take you with this, and I could show you things, on, especially based on the number 7. Blow your mind. Blow your mind. The lineage of Jesus in Luke chapter 3, where it starts with Jesus and goes backwards to Adam, who is, and then Adam, which is the Son of God. 
There's 77 names in there. Isn't that something? The word church, you know how many times it's in the Bible? 77. And you see, the, the lineage of Christ in Luke 3 takes you all the way back from Jesus to God, showing you who is the heir of God. Whatever God has, who gets it, right? Okay, because you have to follow the lineage to see who, who gets the inheritance. Well, Christ, 77, between, between Christ and God, and the church is mentioned 77 times, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? I just, I love that. And that's, in, in when I'm looking for numbers, that's, that's sort of how my mind works. But I'm not really, well, I am looking at numbers in a way. Uh, Revelation 7. And in Revelation 7, we've got two groups of people here. Uh, very specific. And I know this probably blows away some people's eschatology. Um, I can't help it. I, I can only just, I can only go by what I see. We have two groups of people in Revelation 7. We have the 12 tribes mentioned by name and by number. There's a number for each tribe. There's 12 of them. And so God is going to do something with all 12 of those tribes, but he's only going to do it with 12,000 from each of those tribes. Now, 12,000 times 12 gives you what? Gary. 144,000. Thank you. I knew you were going to finish it later. Okay. Um, 144,000. And that number means something. You'll see it in the Bible. Okay. In fact, I'll give you this one. You know how many times the word Jerusalem is mentioned in the New Testament? 144 times exactly. 12 times 12. Isn't that something? And it all speaks of New Jerusalem, which has 12 gates, 12 foundations. Uh, what was it measured? 144? I can't remember. But it's got 12s and 144s all over it. Okay? And that word is in your New Testament of a King James Bible. 144 times. 12 times 12. It's not in the NIV that many times. It's not in the New American Standard that many times. It's not in any other Bible that many times. It's only in the King James that number of times. It's perfect. Don't take a word out. Don't add a word into it. All right. But anyway, here's how I was studying. This is what came to me last night. Uh, after these things. And this is after the sixth seal. All right. And it's probably a, some things we didn't cover, but let's move on. After the sixth seal, and this is what you're going to see with every one of these seven things that God does. We have the seven seals, we have the seven trumpets, and then we have the seven vials of wrath. It's, it's always between the sixth one and the seventh one, there's a pause in there. Between the sixth seal being opened and the seventh seal being opened, there's a there's like narration given here, a story of some kind, okay? And I don't know exactly why that is. Between the, between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, there's another narration, another story, another teaching that he gives. And the same thing with the vials of wrath. Between the sixth vial of wrath and the last vial of wrath, there's another like parentheses, there's something in there that he's pausing and, and he's teaching you with it. Again, I don't know exactly why it's that way, but it is that way. Uh, if you study it out and come up with a good answer, I'd love to hear it. And after these things, I saw four angels, four, uh, and that represents something, standing on the four corners of the earth. Now, wait a minute. 
I thought the earth was, I it was round. Well, it is. So, do what? Four compass points. It's four directions. And, and believe me, I know flat earthology. I've studied it for a living, okay? Those people are so... Some of them are just stupid. Okay? Others are very smart people. And I know a couple of them. They're very intelligent people. But their heart has been deceived. Not their mind. The heart always directs the mind. Always. How is it that we believe... There are people who believe that Jesus lived, existed. They may even believe that he is the son of God. But it's with the heart man believeth unto salvation. Amen? So you can have the head knowledge. But not what they call the heart knowledge. And that is true in the Bible. And there are some people I know that believe the earth is flat. And it's... It, it's a heart issue. There's something, there's something in, according to Ezekiel 14, a stumbling block in their heart that causes them to go astray like that. Because it never makes any sense. It never does. And you can't reason with them either. You can't, I've tried. I have tried I've tried reasoning with scripture. I've tried reasoning with very simple things. You cannot reason with them at all. They, they, so that's not in their head. That's in their heart. But anyway, you're right. It is the four directions. The four corners are north, south, east, and west. Four cardinal directions. Four compass points, as he says. Four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth okay because there is a south wind there is a north wind our weather patterns are changing right now okay it's going to be in the 80s this week instead of the 90s or hundreds because weather patterns are changing and we're starting to be influenced now by northern winds okay there is a, a west wind there is an east wind. All right. So he's holding back the four winds of the earth. But let's let's take this up one level. Wind in the Bible. Let's say John three, when Jesus was teaching Nicodemus about the spirit, what did he use? What illustration did he use? The wind. And the word spirit means breath or air or wind is what it means. So we're not just holding back the four physical winds. We're holding back four spiritual winds. Okay? Four. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. That's, that's what phrase got me when I put my notes together. And we're going we're gonna to study that. The four winds of the earth... That the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. The seal, we'll study that a little bit later on. But that's the Holy Spirit. We are sealed. Ephesians 1 says we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. There's something that these four winds are going to bring forth that are going to hurt this world. And Al Gore will not be able to stop it. Okay? The environmentalists are going to lose their lunch over this one. Okay, verse three, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed and 
Then were sealed were 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. We'll get into all that. that. That'll be probably December, January by the time we get to verse 4. Okay? You think I'm kidding. So, uh, I, I just, I had put these verses down and I was just going to go right on to the 144,000. But... I prayed about it and God said, no, Mike, back up. Let's study this for a minute. So I just typed in and did a search for the four winds in the Bible. Okay. And it's an easy search. It's only found nine times in the Bible. Surely you can study nine verses in the Bible. Surely you can do that. That's easy. Okay. Uh, it's not like studying the word God which is like over 4,000 times in the Bible, all right? Uh, but this one you can do easy. What do these four winds represent? What do they stand for? Uh, I know that one of the places that I went to, Ezekiel 37, and, and there it is right there. Ezekiel 37. So take your Bible, turn to Ezekiel 37. And this, this may be, this may be as far as we get today. But this is, this is how I put my notes together. I would go then to Ezekiel. I already know what's in Ezekiel 37. Um, I know the gist of it. And I know some of the things about it. But you go back and read it again because there's always something new to learn from the Bible, isn't there? You can read something a thousand times. And then come back to it a thousand and one times and go, I never saw that there. I never, never understood that until just now. So Ezekiel chapter 37. In Ezekiel 37, if we were to just be simple, it would be the Valley of the Dry Bones. Okay. Now, we all know that story. We grew up hearing that story. That there's an old spiritual Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones, okay? And the foot bone connected to the ankle bone, ankle bone connected to the leg bone, and so on and so on and so on. So in a, you keep going, keep going, sis. Sing it in the background while I'm teaching this, okay? So here is, since he mentioned the four winds, here is something now that the four winds are going to do. And then we'll, it'll sort of give us the idea of what these four winds are. Not just, the, again, not just the physical winds, the spiritual ones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel 37, 1, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Now, think of people in the Bible that were resurrected. From the dead. Um, I think one of the first was the Shunammite woman's son. That, I don't know if that's exactly the first, but it's one of the first ones. One of the early ones in the Old Testament. And about how long was he dead for? Not very long. He died in his mother's arms. The Bible says... Uh, it seems to look like from the text, he may have had some sort of sunstroke. He was out in the sun with his, with his daddy and he said, my head, my head. And he just collapsed and he died in his mother's arms. And his mother, uh, is wanting the prophet to know about this, Elisha. And, um, I think probably that the child was resurrected the same day. I'm not sure, but I think it was probably the same day. We have the, uh, we have the widow's son in Jesus' day, and they were carrying his body on his way to be buried. And we don't know how long he had been dead, but Jesus resurrected him from the dead. And some might say, well, he was in a coma 
and he came out of it or anything like that. Anything to deny a miracle. But then let's go beyond that. We have Lazarus. Now, Lazarus didn't just die that morning or didn't faint that morning. Uh, I'm missing the, uh, the damsel who was 12 years old, where Jesus said, Talita kumi, which means damsel arise. And um, she had not been dead very long. Um, but anyway, we know Lazarus was dead four days. They had already sealed the tomb with a stone because of the smell. Their embalming practices basically were limited to rubbing spices and ointments on the skin to mask the smell long enough for them to have a proper funeral and then a burial. And then once the burial was done, seal him up uh, because that body's going to stink. They didn't embalm like the Egyptians did, we don't think. Um, the way we preserve bodies now is a whole lot better than has been done in the past. So usually a funeral for a person was done fairly quickly. In Lazarus' case, he was dead already four days. And when Jesus said, take ye away the stone, they immediately said, surely my Lord, he stinketh. It's been four days by now. Uh, let's not roll that stone away. No, we're going to roll the stone away. And so they moved the stone away and we know Lazarus had been dead four days and Jesus brought him back to life. And when they unwrapped him, he wasn't night of the living dead. He was Lazarus again. He was young Lazarus again. But this is different now. These are, these are beyond just buried corpses or these are just these are beyond people that died that day the the text gives you the idea the valley was full of bones it doesn't say skeletons it says bones giving you the idea that this valley might have been the site of a of a battle and carcasses were laying everywhere and over time, the carcasses, nature of the body, you know, there's this phrase that says nature keeps a clean house. And so all the bones were picked clean. And over time, they're just laying out there. And, you know, when, when um, animals and birds come in to feed off that, they don't take care to leave the bones connected together. So they're scattered all over the place. So now this is not some easy thing that's going to happen here. We're going to resurrect something that's not only dead, it's dead dead. Or as uh, Jerry Clower used to say, graveyard dead. Okay. And so verse two, and he caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. No bone marrow left. No sinews left. Everything had been gone. They were probably in some cases brittle. So we're dead beyond dead. Um, which let me throw this. This will be my opinion. And I'll just do it in the form of a question. Do you think it matters what form the dead body is? When Jesus returns to resurrect everybody, you think it matters? I don't either. I don't either. Um, for thousands of years, they buried semen where? Out at sea. And the chances are most of those corpses would have been eaten by something before they ever hit the bottom. Okay? And it... It does not matter the condition of the body. Um, some people have a, uh, an issue with uh, being, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Cremated. Uh, 
Abraham said, though I am but dust and ashes. The Apostle Paul said, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity. I personally don't believe that it affects your salvation nor God's ability to resurrect you no matter what condition your body is in at the time he comes to resurrect you. Okay? What about the Christians that were fed to the lions? Okay? Their bodies certainly were not in very good shape. And more than likely, that what was left was just taken and thrown out into a dump heap somewhere. And that was it. Okay, and that's been thousands of years. Think of thousands of years now, people laying in graves or the dead, laying in the ground somewhere all this time. And I don't, I don't think it matters one bit to God. Certainly it doesn't matter here. He's trying to tell us this illustration here. They're very dry. There is absolutely no life left in here whatsoever. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause, oh, I love this. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. He's saying this to the bones. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring flesh up upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And again, I, I'm telling you that for thousands of years, no Jew ever knew who Christ was, who the Messiah was, who their Lord was, who their God was. He was always hidden from them, a mystery. Those who, who kept serving him, they served him by faith alone. Okay? They, and to this day, the Jews don't know who their God is. They worship. Yeah, they, in some small way, according to the Old Testament, but I, I know a lot about what they believe, and I'm telling you, they are way off from who God is. But that's not, that's going to change. And it's going to change in Revelation 7. That's why this story and this and Revelation 7 are linked by these four winds. Because what's going to happen is God's going to seal them and they're going to know who Jesus is. Amen. Just like, just like Joseph went to his brethren, fell upon them and wept over them and said, you can't believe how glad I am to see you. Oh, and listen, don't worry. I'm not setting you up. What you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good. Don't worry. I, I came here ahead of you to save you this day. Boy, I like this stuff. So he said in verse seven, so I prophesied as I was commanded. As I prophesied, there was a noise. See? And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto what? The wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say unto to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the where? Four winds. There it is. O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So as I prophesied, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto the, into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And what did it take? You see, they were there. They had sinews on them. They had skin on them. They had muscles. They had eyes. They had hair. They had everything. They didn't have no breath. And what did it take? Four winds. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The story of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, his ascension on high, 
they're going to know this one of these days. They're going to know it probably better than us they're going to know it. Because God's going to put it right into their heart and he's going to seal them. They're going to receive the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God's Son crying, Abba, Father. And God's already said, when this happens, they shall know that I am the Lord. That's just one thing that you find out is going to happen with these four winds and sealing of the 144,000. Isn't that something? Just one phrase in the Bible, four winds. It's only in nine places. And I don't think I picked all nine for my notes. Okay? You study the rest. Well, I will tell you, we'll be in Daniel 7 next Sunday. Okay? So you study Daniel 7, all right? Father, thank you for taking us who were not your people, who did not know you as our God, who were not of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were nothing as far as this world, the heathen of the Gentiles, and breathing into us the four winds. And we know our Savior and our God. His name is Jesus Christ. And we know He died for us. And we know He rose from the dead. And we know that His blood atones for our transgressions. And we know who our God is. And Father, we pray for the people that you love the most. The Jew. Israel. Because that's where your heart is. It's like Aaron, the high priest, going in with his breastplate, with the names of the 12 tribes upon his heart, so that when the sacrifice is made, the names of your people was on Jesus' heart the day he died. Father, we look forward to the day when you receive us as yours and when you redeem your people Israel. Hasten that day, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.